Sweet. We're live. Oh. Hi, everybody. Hello. We're here today to um, show you a little bit about um, our flame working curriculum that we have. And so we thought we'd start by just talking about um, just how to get started, the very basics. Um, we actually do have, which a lot of people I don't think sometimes realize, there's actually a, a couple of different kinds of glass that we do here. And the one we're going to focus on today is a glass that's typically made to be used to make beads. So Kaylee can show you. We have a little. We have a couple examples of some beads here and there. Just a few. And yeah, everywhere. Few. And um, so that's what we're going to do today. So the glass we're going to use is a is a glass that has what we call an expansion rate, um, and then it's attached to a number. And so that's kind of how we deal with glass that we use to melt to other glass. So the manufacturer gives mm -hmm. it an expansion rate, right? Yeah, it gives like it a, a number, number. Yeah. And then that's how we know that if we're going to melt anything to that, we need to make sure it's the same number. That kind of simplifies it. But let's just say, so today what I'm focusing on using is a glass that has an expansion rate of 104. So any glass I use to melt to anything I'm doing today has to have that same expansion rate. Otherwise, we might have, um, they'll pretty much melt in the torch evenly and, and together, and you might not notice any difference, but it's when they cool. If we use one that has a different number, they'll cool at different rates, and then that's when you can have stress and yeah. cracking. And they start and, cracking and falling and, apart. Yeah, and not and, being very stable. Yeah. So, so the other things, we, we kind of categorize this glass that we're using today as soft glass, um, and basically it, it has a few expansion rates within that category of soft glass. So people who do a lot of glass fusing, they also are using soft glass. So one of them, two of the most popular ones is 90 yeah, 96. and 96. Yep. Yeah. So, and this torch would also work really well for that too. So just to kind of give you a little background, this torch is, is what I think is the the really user-friendly, great way to start. I mean, I think yeah. cost and and then all the complicated things like ventilation and eye protection and all that that goes with it is really minimal. And it makes it, it's an easy setup for people, pretty portable, and like I said, not all that expensive. So, so you could just do this in your home, right? I mean, that, that isn't that one of the advantages to this yeah. type of setup? I know people sometimes will ask us, you know, well, I'm going to have this open torch, an open flame. Is that, you know, how safe is that? Well, you don't want to stick your hand in yeah, it. Yeah, they're but, probably not. That but probably other than that, that, it's not. No, I'm teasing. It's really, but it really is. Once you get used to it a little bit, it's really, um, you know, like I said, I've taught so many beginning B classes on this torch, and and it's amazing. You know, people are really intimidated at first, but after about five minutes, it's really, it's really amazing how, you know, you kind of forget about it. And yeah. it's not that big a deal. And it's not a big um, uh, cost either, really, no. right, to get started. I mean, uh, so sometimes you refer to this type of a torch as a uh, single gas um, torch, right? So you have it hooked up here to a can of map gas that right. you can get at a hardware store or one of the big box, you know, um, yep. home improvement type stores. And that's not all that expensive, right? And then, then you just have the torch head. Yeah. And then, well, and then, you know, then you have some of the components. And we actually do. I don't know if I'm supposed to plug things, but we actually do have a pretty nice little kit where the hot head comes in it and an assortment of glass. And then the mandrels, these are what's called mandrels, and they're basically stainless steel sticks that you wrap the glass around, and then that's how you end up with a hole in it is you're wrapping it around a rod. Yeah, and we left some here on the, yeah, you know, they're, these they're, are ones that are still, obviously still on the mandrels, right? These beads were, you just haven't taken them off for whatever reason. No, I haven't because I'm lazy. <laughs> but, um, but they also, to, to note while you're looking at them, they, they do have a coating on them of, of what we call bead release or sometimes people call it bead Yeah, I think separator. this one you might be able to see it pretty easily, right? So you can see yeah. this is all the bead release here. So right? that's the barrier on the steel that keeps the hot glass from sticking. So that's absolutely something you have to have. So, you know, I just have one sitting out. There's all different kinds, but um, they all pretty much do the same type of thing. Bead release, right? Is that Bead what's release. in the, in the mm -hmm. container, so? Yep, and you just stir it up and dip it, and they end up looking kind of like a sparkler. And that's how you know that's, you know, the good, the good coating. So after we do this, I thought we'd do a demo. You gonna do the demo? Yeah, I'm not doing the demo. <laughs> I mean, I could, but it'd probably be better if you did the demo. Uh, so. You could do it. I know you could. 
Um, after we do that, then the reason, this is really kind of loud, so um, you get used to it, but it does make it difficult to talk over. So we'll do it so you can see it and hear it and, and get a good feel for what it, what it actually can do. And then I'll probably go to this torch, talk about this torch just a little bit, because I also do um, a lot of my more sculptural soft glass things um, in this bigger torch that has a little more firepower, just makes things go a little faster. But the setup becomes a little more complicated too. So this isn't always something people want to jump right into when they're not really even sure they're going to enjoy it or mm -hmm. not. So that's what another reason why this is kind of a good, a good deal. So, well, if you have you know any questions you know while Val's you know demonstrating, um, then you know feel free to reach out to us. You know you can comment in the section below or you know send us a message on Facebook or Instagram, and you can always email us mm -hmm. Facebook at DelphiGlass.com too. So, good job. Yeah. I wasn't reading that or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say FB. I did. Did you? No, oh, I, I didn't. didn't. Oh, okay. I got it um, right, I think. Okay, so so the other thing about this too, so there there is eye protection involved when yeah, you're using this kind of yes. thing. And and the, I always tell people the two components of this type of setup, there are two things you always want to address based on the torch you're using. And those two things are eye protection and ventilation because those two things can change dramatically based on how much firepower you're using, yeah. what glass you're using, does it have metals in it, some of them do. Um, so those kinds of things can change but that's once again why I really think this is a great little way to start because this torch just doesn't actually get hot enough to really emit any bad colorants or anything from the in, glass from right the from glass the glass in into the fumes so so you know really nice clean air exchange is what you need um, it's always I think advisable if you're thinking of, of continuing to do this that you work towards a hood you know work towards a, a hood with a draw so that you know you'll yeah, know. you see we're sitting sitting under this nice yeah. big hood here and there's so. always carbon monoxide involved when you're when you're burning a fuel so that's another concern but like I said with this setup and how minimal it is just clean air exchange is really all you really need make sure you are, are replacing the air that this is burning with you know some kind of so if you're working air. in a room maybe with a fan or something you yeah. can crack open a window that type of thing right yeah. nothing yeah exactly nothing major and um so this glass too we didn't talk about we talked about numbers just a little bit but um when we're talking about the soft glass and the you know we, we also work with a glass called borosilicate that that has an expansion rate of 33 so you can see from 104 to 33, quite a big difference. So it does take different firepower to melt that 33. But this glass is the 104, and it is about as soft as it comes, meaning yep. it takes as little heat as, you know, it, it doesn't take as much firepower to melt. So, so this obviously is a good choice. This 104 is a good choice of glass mm -hmm. for this torch because... You know, it should be easier hot, to melt, right? Not the hottest torch on this on the market, but also the glass is the softest, so it works. So, well. isn't that one of the main reasons why we use the 104, especially in this yes. type of application? Is so if you're familiar with like COEs of glass, as Val has mentioned, you know that we say the higher the number, the softer the glass, and so so the 104 is the the highest number of COE glass w we work with. So it should be a little bit easier to melt with a with this type of a torch. However. Right? You know, the 90 and the 96 can be melted really nicely in this torch, too. And a lot of people choose to just have this set up around to do some some flame working components to add to their fusible oh, to your glass, too. Work, yeah. So it's nice. a, you know, like I said, it's kind of a, it's yeah. kind of a great little all-purpose deal. Well, I was going to show a couple of the safety glasses. I know okay. you mentioned that earlier. And so, um, as Val was mentioning, you know, it's really important to have, uh, protect your eyes. Um, some of it is just a comfort thing because of the flame and you kind of keep looking at the flame. So uh, you'll see that a lot of these uh, le lenses are tinted a bit and uh, they're tinted for, uh, to get rid of ultraviolet light but also to um, cut back on the sodium flare so that, that bright yellow of the light with uh, the flame. And, and depending on the glass you use, sometimes that, it's brighter, right? The yellow. Right. And just as, so I don't forget, this torch and the reason I'm saying it's real user friendly too, this the the professional recommendation for this for eye protection is basically just something to cover your eyes 
You know, a tint mm. is not required. A didymium lens is not required. A um, welder shade is not required. It's just not. It's just not hot and bright enough to really have any kind of damaging properties to your eyes. However, you will see the soda flare when I put the glass in the flame, and yeah. that's what some of these glasses are designed to. Um, yeah, so it's more of a comfort level, right, yeah. I think. It's just trying to get rid of that bright kind of yellow. Um, this particular pair, what's, what's really nice about these is they fit over they fit over a pair of prescription glasses. So if you're already you know, wearing some glasses and, again, you want to uh, put on something that will help with that sodium flare. Mm -hmm. um, people, been, people have been wearing them that don't wear glasses. They're pretty Yeah, pretty, sometimes they're just pretty nice. Right? They're just nice and big, so look at those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what's nice is they kind of obviously. Yeah, you look like these, a bug. I know. They're, <laughs> they're pretty nice, right? <laughs> yeah, um, nice. And then, uh, then there's another pair. I have another pair in here. These are, of course, both uh, you can get from Delphi, right? So, which is nice. Um, and they do have a coating on them. Again, that's supposed to help kind of oh, take yeah. that out. These are the like the shop glass kind of looking uh, yeah, ones, they're right? Nice and they're, they're nice, right? Tend so, to be the yeah, lesser of the cost. Yeah, and then they, um, you know, again, obviously provide a lot of protection in case. The glass pops on you, which which can happen sometimes, soft right? Soft glass. That's the that's the other thing. With soft glass, you never can be sure that it's shocky. It doesn't yeah. like its temperature change quickly, so it can cold rod in a hot flame can cause some popping. So, like I said, the most important thing with this is something to cover your eyes. Yeah, but and I oh, I think Kaylee has a lens. I think she's going to put. Oh, in front of her um, phone there. Yeah, we'll just so you can sort of see the difference between one. Of, we think you can see the difference between what the flame looks like with the lens or without the lens. But we'll, we'll share that yeah. when I do it. All right. Um, these I actually have clip-ons on mine, and so we sell those as well. Which oh yeah, are which nice is certain because nice. yeah. sometimes when you reach a certain age where you can't <laughs> you see might too need, good anymore, might need a little assistance. Yeah, uh, might with need the... a little assistance. So, so actually, they're, they're kind of a nice thing too. So, okay. So, how about that? Should we just yeah, make just something? light it up? Yeah, let's let's. Okay, for be. this one, I'm wearing I'm just wearing my regular glasses because they're big enough and they're, you know. I'm gonna put on these nice shop looking ones. <laughs> okay, I like these. Good, nice. I might wear these Oops. later just for the fun of it. Okay, I use a match. People can use a striker, a lighter. They say it's not a really good idea, but matches I feel are really pretty safe. So I light my match. I turn my gas on. And you kind of came under the flame. I noticed, yeah. right? Yeah. If I. See, it's pretty loud. Yeah. If I just strike my match and put it out here, the gas will just blow it out. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of sneak up on it. I got it. Okay, so I have dipped my mandrels, and they probably are still a little wet. So I'm going to just go ahead and, so if you hold it in the flame, and then I take it out, if you, you're just looking to not see any dark, which is still a little dark up in yeah, I could see it getting lighter while you were doing that. I don't know if it's how well yeah, that showed up on camera, but and I also noticed where you're working the flame. Um, you know, you're at like there's kind of a point there that you're sort of working at that and, and not coming like close to the torch head itself. Yeah, this has a working flame of um, this they call the blue cone area, and and there's a, a lack of oxygen down there, so we actually always sort of stay. There's no reason to be down there unless you really are wanting to reduce, which that's another thing. Um, so the, top, the hottest part of this flame is right at the top of that blue cone. So from that point out, it, it's cooler. But even though I don't see it much out here, I can use it as like a back burner to keep something warm while I'm doing something else. So when I really want to melt, I'm going to be right down on top of that blue cone for the hottest flame. Do you see the soda flare? There it is. There's not. There it is. There's not. So you might want to pull that up and down, Kaylee, just to show the difference. Yeah, I can't even, see, hardly even see it, you know, know with these on, so, it. yeah. It's okay, nice. so I'm starting my glass a little bit, so now I'm going to come in and I've got to heat my mandrel. So it has to be, both have to be hot, else they won't stick. So... I'm going to heat my handle, I'm going to heat my glass. My glass starts to droop a little, I just sort of compensate for it. Then I drop below, I'll stick it on there, and then I pull back, and then I just wind out what's soft. And then when it gets stuck, because it's stiffening, 
I stop and then I just bring it in and let the fire sort of cut it off. So that's a, my first gather. So, you know, you probably had a lot more than one gather. So I'll do a couple. So I can see at this point you're not really concerned what it looks like as so much. You're just trying to get some glass yeah. on the mandrel. I'm just trying to get glass to work. So see, I'm kind of out here. I don't really want this to get gooey and drip. This is the one I need to get hot. So I back that out into the back part. So it, because it does need to stay warm. I do have to keep it hot, otherwise it could thermal shut. Yeah, so the risk is keeping the glass out of the flame for too long, right, at this yeah. point, because you, you got it pretty hot. So I just add some, and then what I do is I, when I, I mean, I, I just put some glass on there, and then I'll put my um, glass down, and then I usually go back to my dominant hand, because that was kind of the reverse. So now what I want to do is just get this melted. So see how ropey it still looks? So that's telling me that it's still pretty stiff because it's still holding that ropey texture. Yeah, you can see where you had coiled around the yeah. glass. So now once you kind of stay in here, you're going to see that start to, all those ribs fill in a little bit. Yeah. So now it's getting soft enough that I probably can do something with it. So it's very, a very gentle, it's not a pushing and prodding. It's you get the glass soft, and then you use your graphite paddle as sort of a suggestion as to what you want it to do. Um, if I push and, and smash while it's stiff, I'll just break that beam release underneath, mm. and then we got to start over. So. So it should be pretty easy to tell if you've gotten it hot enough to start yep. manipulating it. Yeah, and like I said, I'm not. If I go here and it, it doesn't, I don't feel a nice soft. Then I or it clicks, then I know I'm too I'm too hard. And then I'll just go back in. But I don't ever want to go back to molten because then I'm just gonna lose my shape and I'm gonna have to start all over again. So once I've got it on there, I'm gonna kind of do a good job of getting it to the temperature I need to shape it, but not to have it melt off center. So that's just a uh, little bit. Is that good? Yeah, that was I mean, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Put I mean, a I dot could, on it. I could add another color. I could put a dot yeah, yeah. on it. I didn't. I meant to pull stringers. But yeah, I, I like the ones with dots on them. So. Well, I didn't. I didn't pull any real stringers. So. Probably wasn't the best color either because it's gonna. See, the colors also shift when they're hot, so sometimes you don't get the true you don't get the true look of what it's actually going to be. Is that not tight enough? Oh, no, just tighten that hell bracket. It's not tight enough. Man. No, it's not. Oh, I, got it. I think yeah. I just hit it. So now I do have a little stringer. This um, is a little high for me, this whole setup. Down, up, and then you just ball it up. So the, the fire just is hot enough to just ball the glass up, like, like especially those little dots, right? I mean, you don't really have to worry about how round you make them at the beginning because the heat of the flame is going to do that. Right. So we're kind of back to some of those same principles that we see like infusing where when the glass is molten it wants to be round and you know wants to be a quarter of an inch and tries to do what it can to get there. So yeah, it will once it gets yeah, once it gets molten, that's exactly right. Anyway, so that's that's good, right? Yeah, yeah, we got it. Yes, it so now what would you do with the bead? I mean if well, if well, you really were done. If I was really doing this bead, I was gonna melt those dots in because they look crap. <laughs> So I'm just too, so you do it, you get it in there, like, just like what you're saying. So the, the heat, the more you heat it, the, the flatter they're getting, right? Yeah.
Yeah, it's hard to even see the color at this so when point. It, and when it starts to cool, you'll see. Oh yeah, where the dots are. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's good, right? Yeah. I don't really have any place to put it. <laughs> Well, that's sort of my point. So what do you do when you're done, right? Well, so you're going to get mean, up and go get that can of um, my, I mean, my stuff. I you know, will. The, the, yes, the, right down at the end. In front, of, in front of Finnegan's picture on the... Oh. The annealing bubbles. <laughs> it's hard to get good help. <laughs> good. <laughs> it is. Okay, now what, so are, we now what are we going to do? Okay. All right, okay. so... That was not too long. No. Um, so, yeah, these are what we call annealing. Are they annealing beads or bubbles? Bubbles, I think, is okay. what they call them. And what it actually is is if you pick them up, they're just these tiny little balls. And when you squeeze them, they just kind of, they're filled with air. And it's just a nice, light, airy Insulating material of some sort, right? Yep. doesn't burn. And so when I put it down in there, it just allows the heat of the bead to cool slowly because it's you know staying no air is able to get to it at this point so that is not annealing because the um technically not annealing. no we're not technically annealing but that's what they're called but that's not really what's happening we're right? just trying to slow down the so they don't cool right. too quickly in thermal shock right yes. isn't that right really what annealing we're trying is to something do you should always do you could do it later or you know in the beginning i you just don't need to do it in the and then we would do that in a kiln right the annealing would would go something into a kiln that would or reach the 950 degree temperature yes and and maintain it for some length of time right we yes. didn't need to be able to hold at that temperature for whatever length of time yes okay cool so how about that that was good that anybody was nice, have any, right? nobody has questions, yeah, no huh? questions wow these people yeah i guess you're doing a good, great you're doing a great job i guess explaining it so they, they don't have any questions but we're gonna, you're going to show this other torch set up, right? Yes, I, mean, I am. Good. This is like a, uh, you know, I referred to that first torch as a, uh, a one tank or one gas system, and this one's going to be... Uh, yeah, this one will have, it has... A two tank um, or two, two gases, Oxygen, right? and it has an oxygen feed and a, a propane feed. Propane. Or, or gas, yep. or ba basically. Yeah. So that gives you the oxygen this one you know this one didn't have this is the fuel tank right but it doesn't have another line of oxygen attached to it so the amount of oxygen in that flame is basically what you get um it yeah, coming this, out just pulling from the air yes then. and with this kind of a um, torch you actually have the oxygen that you can control bring in take out yeah the the to the question that i do get a lot people will ask me if they can use their um the their torches that they use to sweat copper oh yeah you know and they yeah. look very similar to this and and my answer usually is did i make a loud noise i hit it oh you're all right okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> um is that i don't really know because i've never had the occasion where i've needed to use one and i would just say try it and if it works but i can tell you the one difference is is these holes so the holes are what the modification mm happen to actually allow more air to come into the flame, which does help sustain a lot of the colors and stuff. Because when you get too much of a lack of oxygen, you'll have some issues with some of your colorants. Is there a difference in temperature, you know, with uh, adding the oxygen? Does it make the flame hotter? Is that yes. the other thing oxygen does yes, for it? Yes, it does. It okay. makes it, yeah. It's the accelerator. Yeah. Darren's got a question. Oxygen bottle or concentrator? Ooh. Well... You know, I, I mean, both work, and, and, and I think concentrators are, would be lovely to have. Um, you know, they come with a little, they could be a little problematic depending. A lot of people get rebuilt ones from, like, the medical industry. Um, they actually do manufacture them now just for flame working, and there's some real nice ones out there that... Um, you know, it's just going to be, it, they, it's oxygen. They're both going to work. So whether you can afford to get a big oxygen concentrator, if you could do that, heck yes, because then you're not hauling tanks or having tanks delivered. And, um, but it tends, they tend to be a little bit expensive. So, and it also depends on the, the, the level you're working. You know, it's easier to, to work with the soft glass with a concentrator because it doesn't take as much firepower. If you're going to do something you know, big and and even go into the borosilicate glass, which is much harder. Then you, you it takes more of it 
takes more oxygen, and so then you kind of have to have a bigger system. So you kind of want to figure out what it is you're interested in working with, and then and then I would I would make that decision. But overall, I mean, if you can afford a concentrator and it works for what you're doing, then that just takes away one expense, and because then you're not you know paying for refilling oxygen tanks and, and yeah. yeah. So so, uh, so you. Um, my understanding is you're going to go through more oxygen than propane. Is that is that correct? Yes, substantially more. Yeah. yeah so oxygen's going to be your biggest expense. Expense. Okay. Yes. Yes. Because you're using. I know you can't see the system, and we probably can't show you, but underneath the table is a manifold that uh, where the oxygen tanks are hooked at the back of the room, and the we have a propane tank that's like what you use for your barbecue grill, right? You know those twenty pound tanks. Um, and again, they're under the table down there, but I think you get the idea. And then, so, but if you can see, the oxygen tanks are like you know four times bigger or something. So yeah, and it's just and it's just easier to um, the the propane is real easy. And yeah, you get you, them you filled don't anywhere. Go so much of that, you know. So, but the oxygen tanks. I mean, those big ones down there. I don't know if Kaylee can yeah. give you a shot. Um, you know, I can roll them, and over the years, I've learned to maneuver them pretty good. But man, I, you can't lift them. You know, you've got to right. So. Um, you're kind of at the, you know, and depending on where, you know, at home, you know, my studio's in, in a basement. It is a walkout, so I can go around the house, but it's still not real conducive to, you know, dragging a big tank like that around and down the hill and, you know, so. So it's interesting how the white turns clear when it gets hot. Yeah. You know, I, I know I have these uh, didymium glasses on, so I'm not seeing the color, but. I didn't really see the orange glow as much, and then, um, but it was transparent. I thought that was well. I'll go back if you, if you want me to, and um, what do you need? Oh, I don't know, just something to, and and turn this torch on. But I don't know already. Can you hear that? You don't hear it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how, this is much quieter. How nice that is. I just need a couple of stringers, and I meant to do it before we started, and then I. Somebody started talking. So the other thing about this torch, too, is, I mean, uh, compared to the other one, is you have a lot more control over the flame. Is yes. that correct? Yes. You do. I can, and I'll show you in a second when I, just let me pull this one. And then. Um, so you're showing kind of how stringers are yeah, made, this right? Is just, yeah, this is just my go-to quick stringer. I'm just kind of balling up uh, the glass. And then when I get the ball big enough, that I think I can pull the size I want, then I'll just come out. It's a little, you know, I can't pull too quick because it's still a little it's too so soft. soft yeah. So I just wait a couple seconds and then, and then once I see it start to lighten, I'll just pull. And, and I'm stopping. I could have pulled longer, but I would have gotten skinnier and so oh. I don't really want them that thin. So the other way you can melt this off is not always the popular way of doing it, but. Okay, so so the other thing for people that are new to this, I you know you might be concerned about like the the heat doesn't really travel up the glass, right? I mean we're not, I mean obviously you're holding onto those rods without any issues, no. and the same thing is true with the mandrel. Is that correct? Yes, because this glass and the stainless steel, they're not conductors of heat, so it it's only going to be hot where the it's in the flame. It's not going to radiate up. You know, up the the rod, so you don't have to really worry about that. And you'll see, I get pretty close. You know, and this flame too. You know, they always say a, a torch or a flame is is a very effective way to heat what's in it, but it's actually an inefficient way to heat what's around it. Because you know, I can you know I can literally put my hands like this. I mean, what an inch yeah. or even close to the flame, and it just feels good. Yeah, don't try that. <laughs> it just don't feels try that. Good. <laughs> it's warm. <laughs> But I mean, you know what I'm saying. It's not like people think, "Ooh, anywhere around here is going to be." Oh yeah, like you're, like I'm sitting here and I don't really feel any heat coming yeah. off the the torch at all. So, right. so um, so anyway, just to to show you, I can turn it back off. And yeah, show the show the lighting it. again. It has so. some kind of complicated stuff down here, and it's really these two knobs are actually the red is for gas and the green is the oxygen. So. We always just remember red is means fuel or fire, and that's the gas part of this torch um, deal. So this is these two knobs actually 
affect a certain number of ports that would be what we call the small fire. And then I can work on, and that's what I was just working on. Um, and then these two sets of controls down here actually control the outer fires, which I can bring that in and make a much hotter fire. So for what I'm doing today, I don't need the outer fire. But I, I'll show you. I'll light, you. I'll light the first one, and you always light your gas first. So you start with your gas flame, and you end with your ga gas flame. So I'm going to turn on, light my, that's just my gas fire, my propane. And then I'll bring in my oxygen. And then you can see it changes the flame a little bit. And we call these candles. So when I adjust this to be n as neutral as I can, these candles are supposed to look just like they're lit on the ends. If they tend to get smeary like that, that's telling me now my my ratio is off. It's not. It, it's like this is more gas than than oxygen. If I do this and pull the oxygen, you really start to hear it hiss, and it gets real narrow and real airy sounding. That's more of an oxidizing flame, meaning it has more oxygen. So when you said uh, you're looking for a neutral flame. Yep. That's what you're, you're talking about, the balance or ratio yes. of gas to oxygen. You want that pretty even right. for the most part. Right. So if I, this is what I want to work with, which I will in a second, then this is good. If, if I need the bigger fire or I want more firepower, then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go out here with the bottom one and pull in more gas and then even that up by bringing in more oxygen. And then it just makes oh, yeah. it bigger. Much wider flame, yeah. right? Yeah, and then you can feel this one. I can, you know, can't you, know, like right mm. in here? I can feel it over here. Okay. Vicki actually has a question about that. Do you feel the heat from the other tank more than the one you're working with now? So the hot head? Mm -mm. No. No, I don't really feel much. I mean, the hot head, like I said, is not, it does a real good job to melt this glass, but it doesn't really give off much heat. This one will give off much more. Okay, so I'll go back to my single small fire which I was okay okay so I'll just you know I Roy thought I should make something in this one too so yeah I'll make something here. I think I need a yeah, do you take requests you should <laughs> <laughs> uh, depends okay so once again I'm just drying making sure that my bead release is dry so in this this flame looks different than what was on the from the hot head torch. So where's is the hottest part of the flame still yeah, it's similar? Still, it's still you, you kinda look at this and you still sort of think of these as candles. Or I mean yep. as the blue cone or whatever in the other one. And so I I would be the hottest part I would say is probably right in here. Okay. You don't want to work too too close on top of the candles because if you do have something drip or something, you don't want it to drip yeah, into drip the, into the ports of yeah, the exactly of the torch head. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, like I said, I'm just going to kind of wrap, and then when I feel like I've got a good amount to work with, then I will try to shape it a little bit. But initially, it's just getting the glass on there. So some of these sculptural pieces that, that I see kind of floating around, like the fish in particular, so I'm assuming, well, I mean, maybe not. That, do you normally use this bigger torch when you're doing those? Or not necessarily? Well, not necessarily. I mean, it just depends. You know, I, I learned on the hothead. You know, I worked on the hothead for I don't even know how many years, three or four years before I ever did anything else. And I was playing around making fish and, and you know, so it's, it's, it just takes a little longer. Hmm. You know, you wouldn't probably want to tackle a real big sculpture with just a hothead. But you, it's truly, I mean, I'm a pretty big fan of that setup. And it's truly amazing what you can do. I just think that for me, a lot of the reasons I go to this is just because, you know, it is faster and um, hotter and quieter. Mm -hmm. And so I enjoy those aspects about it. But I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the hothead, you know, at all. It's just, I could do this really easily in the hothead. It just would take a little longer than it, you know, I don't know if you can't, it's probably nothing you can really tell right now, but well, and as we've talked about before, too, the setup is obviously uh, a little easier, less expensive. Yeah. Is there a um, difference in, I know you talked about this earlier about ventilation, but 
since we're working with a bigger torque, there's probably need to be a little more concerned about it's ventilation. A little, you should be a little more concerned about, but you're still what you're burning has a lot to do with it, and we're still not burn, we're still not melting anything that's got a heavy metal content, or you know, like some some of the boro. There are there is some soft glass that does have um, some metal for reducing purposes, you know, but. Um, you know, for the most part, just these straight colors, you're okay with those, and even in this, I think. But once again, I, I said, you should probably always consider trying to, if you really think you're gonna be interested in this, and you're gonna wanna start working towards maybe, you know, having, yeah, a, having a hood having a hood or some ventilation, yeah. Because at some point, it becomes just as important about what you're burning as it does about your clean air exchange. These are dots. I'm just dotting. I'm just I let my stringer melt, and then I not really not really doing any kind of specific pattern. But what we had thought was, or what Roy had thought was, we do like maybe a little fish or something. Oh yeah, that's what I was thinking. But I didn't. I should have made you pull a stringer. Oh. That's right. We can just kind of put little. So you're putting a dot on top of a dot. Yeah, I wish I had a darker color to put on, but I didn't. Mary's wondering, how do you know if your glass has a lot of metal in it? Um, it's it's oh. advertised that way as a reducing glass usually. Um, a lot of the boro glass has it in it because it helps it stand up to that kind of firepower. But there, there, there is some glass in the soft glass world that they do put some metal in it and they usually call them reduction glasses. So um, you, would, you would know, they, and they're more expensive, substantially more expensive than. So just this type of, so we're, uh, the type of glass you're using is a Italian, right? This correct. 104, yeah. sometimes referred to as a Moretti. Uh -huh. I think they use the term. And in most of those, in fact, they're not reducing glasses, are they, for the most part? For the most part, no. I think there might be a couple that might have a little in it, but not significant, I don't think. Cause, so there are some um, glasses that are manufactured specifically with the metals in them so that you get this um, effect when you use the torch. And as you mentioned before, it's like a, a, what you would call a reduction flame, so mm -hmm. somewhere where you're starting to take some of the oxygen out of the flame, so you would, you would you know, in a torch like this, you would adjust the, either take the oxygen out or add a little more gas, right? Right. That... And what that does when there's metal is that when you reduce the glass, it's like kind of was talking about how you need the oxygen in the flame. So when you take away some of the oxygen, it causes the colorants to sort of leach out. And if there's metal in there, it brings the metal to the surface. Kaylee, that bracelet has a pretty good example of a black... Um, Metallic. Oh, this this one here, I think, yeah. right? So this actually yeah. was, yeah, it's like a black glass, but um, but the metals come to the surface right. by so when you're in a reduction flame. So. Called, what is it called? Silver black, or it's called shoot, metallic black, and that does have some metal in it. Yeah, so either they use reduction or silver. Sometimes that's what you'll hear, right, in the right. descriptions and. Right. We're just doing a little, a little bit of a top fin here. I mean, this, that's what I'm saying. There's just all kinds of things you can do. There's all kinds of ways to do fins. There's all kinds of ways to do fish. And you know, I just think it's kind of fun to start playing around. You know, when you're when you're just starting out. I'm not one of those people that thinks you have to um, acquire a certain level of monotonous repetition before you try anything fun. I think you should just You don't try have to make like fun. Yeah. five thousand dots before you can no. move on to something else. No. Right. Not not in my world. No. So so that just put a little of that um, green on the top and then I'm just gonna soften it a little bit and then I I'll come over here and whoop kind of So here you're using just a pair of tweezers, right? I mean yeah. these are really maybe not even specifically made for flame working no, per not se. Necessarily. Yeah, I know we use them in mosaics a lot of times, those same tweezers. Yeah, just need to... And then earlier you used a pair of um, mashers. mashers, is that what they're called? The, this tool here, 
that um, you're using to, once you got a rounded bead, you can come in while it's soft and, and flatten it on, right? So you have. Yeah, exactly. Give it. It's just to make a disc. Yeah, that's what it's for. So this, but you have to see while I'm doing this, you know, I'm, I get to the point, and this is always when you start getting to the point where you want to do three dimensional things. You start playing around and you get a little bit obsessed with pinching those up there or doing something. You forget that you really do have to make sure you take care of the heat level of this bead. Otherwise, you're going to have it pop off of there while you're playing around. So, you know, once I do a couple things, I may stop and then go back and just go out in the flame a little bit just to make sure I keep some heat in it. While you're working, Valerie, we've got some more questions coming in. The first one is, do you use an extraction system when burning? Is that necessary? Or can you also open a window or even keep a window closed? Hmm. Well, I don't know what you mean. Extraction, you mean like a hood with a vent yeah, and draw, a draw? Yeah, probably drawing water, uh, drawing the air out. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I said, I think it's ideal. I think that when you're just starting with this hot, with the hothead system and when things aren't big and hot and, and you know, I think you're okay to, to play around for a little while without one. Um, like I said, pay attention to what you're burning though. And if you start getting really hot and melting really hot glass and things that might have the metals, then you, you definitely need a hood with a draw. And, uh, but always clean air, always, no matter what you're burning, you gotta have that, you gotta take care of that other product that you're worried about in terms of ventilation, which is the carbon monoxide. So they do make um, pretty inexpensive carbon monoxide detectors. So I always tell people in my classes, you know, if you, if you, where you want to set up, you're not really sure about your ventilation and whether you can get enough clean air, then just go ahead and um, get one of those. I actually think they're under $10. And then wherever you're working, plug it in. And um, if it goes off, then you know you've got to figure out some way to get another little source of air moving through there. So that's really, you know, as simple as that part of it. So that could be an open window, right? I mean, yeah. don't you think? I mean, just and something fan, that brings fresh air in with a, with a fan you know, and a window. Now, yeah. a, a flame is not always a good idea or easy for you to maneuver, a, you know, a, a, a wind with a flame, but you can offset it so it's blowing either behind you or, you know, across the Basically, you just you. need to exchange air, right? So get air, right. you know. Right. Other question we've got in here is the metal glass is used for more of a effect or look. It's not stronger than a oh. piece of glass without metal in it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually it's usually designed, like I said, to either help the glass um, hold up to the firepower or to get a specific sort of pearlized, iridized look. The fish right there, too, is a good example of soft glass. Um, oh, yeah, it looks like it has almost like an iridescent sort of um, sheen to the surface. I, I'm not sure how well that shows up on the... A little, not great. Yeah. I know the lighting might be, you know, not so great. Yeah, it all, it all looks shiny, but the, bo the body of that, it has more of that kind of, you know, all iridized, almost rainbow sort of look to the outside surface. So it's just a design uh, aesthetic decision, right, I about so. using yeah. those types of glasses. Yeah. They're, they're pretty popular, and they really are kind of fun to play with. But This is just um, a little fish, so I just put and trying to put a little bit of lip action around him. I do his little eyes. I'm not going to get real carried away. I do have some over there. Kaylee can show you that maybe we're a little more involved in this, but... Yeah, I think, or like one of these, this is really similar mm -hmm. to, I think, is what she's kind of making, you know, if you see it from the side, right? And this is actually, I think, another one of those glasses, those metallic ones. See how it has almost a metallic sheen to it? Um, and then, you know, she put pink lips on this one, right? So you can see that the eyes are just a series of dots, right? One dot on top of another dot and, you know, adding fins and dorsal fin, that kind of fun stuff. I like my little toucan. Did you show it? Oh, oh I know. That was pretty the, nice. That one. Right. What's that one over there? Oh, that's just some picture. kind of parrot, but there's oh. a little toucan. So it's just fun. You can do all I, kinds of things. I can't focus on that guy. 
The other thing this about this so this like glass, that. I can tell you guys, is that the the, the colors that it comes in is just they're just great, and it's really the standard colors are a really frog sitting not on a bead, that expensive. That's So I'm just cutting, I just cut into his lip to kind of draw that up. I don't know if you can see how that works, so you can see it. But, mm -hmm. no. And you're just using a, a regular knife, right? A stainless yeah, steel knife. Yeah, just a knife regular and... knife. That, and I did the same on the other side. It just gives the lips a little pucker. Okay, so that's kind of, that's kind of it. Now this one... You know, when I have these kinds of extremities, like thin fins and, you know, thicker body, and this is when you start kind of needing more than just some kind of fiber blanket or this annealing beads. You really, annealing in a kiln at 950 would be really something you'd want to start doing as well once you start getting into this three-dimensional stuff because, you know, the idea with this one is, you know, was, there was nothing going on. So when I was finished with it, I could kind of reheat it and I could actually kind of even out the temperature of that mass of glass so that when I put it away, it has a better chance of cooling evenly. That fish doesn't really have that opportunity because the fins are, the, the top fin is real thin because I pinched it. So the heat leaves that immediately. The body is still pretty dense, so it hangs on to heat. So there isn't really a way for me to reheat that entire mass and even out that temperature. If I did, I'd lose the sure. fin and the eyeballs. And, and so that's where an, a kiln or a kneeling oven comes into play. It, it lets it stay in there safely at that 950 degrees so that the body can actually cool down maybe to 950 and the fins can heat up to 950 and then at the end when that whole body or that mass of glass is at even 950 degrees that's when annealing occurs yep so okay. that's what i got so in the very back of the classroom i don't know if anybody can see we've got the chili pepper annealer set up back yeah, there no, that was great. That was Good. wonderful. So hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed that. Uh, yeah, let, let I, us know if you have questions. Yeah, if you have questions, you know, we still answer them afterwards, don't we? Mm -hmm. Kaylee tracks us down, and then we she makes us answer them. So we, yeah. we're happy to do it. And suggestions for... Yeah, if you have ideas of what you'd like to see next, um, reach out to us. Yeah, I think we have some. Somebody asked us a little while ago about, was asking us about the various glass saws that we sell. And, um, and ring yeah, band saws versus ring saws, for example. We sell a couple of different um, brands of the of ring saws and of the of the band saws. So uh, we were going to show those, I think, on the next one. So in a couple of weeks, if you want to see all about saws, you can come back, and we're going to show you how they work, um, the goods uh, and bad things about them. And uh, awesome, that would be yeah. So that should be fun. Exciting. We're going to cut some glass with a saw, right? <laughs> yeah, That's always are. fun. So yeah. Well, thanks for joining us yep, today. Thanks a lot.